the secret courts produced to some unexpected evidence. There is, on occasion, a rare opportunity to ask some questions in open session of an intelligence agent who stands behind a curtain called Witness A. And the question that we asked in 2003 was, would you use evidence if it came from torture? And the answer was, yes. The only question is, what weight we give it? And for the next three years, in our courts, there was a battle as to was it lawful in England to rely upon evidence that came from torture, internationally prohibited, the worst of the worst of crimes, crimes against humanity, for which there is no defense. But our lawyers, our government's lawyers, on the instruction of our ministers, fought for three years as the case went up to the House of Lords to argue that they should be permitted to use evidence that came from torture. They lost, but the instructive part of this is that that is what they intended to do. And by accident, from a voice behind a curtain, we ever learnt in the first place that that was what was being done in our name. Principles and conventions internationally that we are bound by, by international treaty, have been jettisoned too. The Refugee Convention makes it an absolute mandatory requirement to safeguard the lives and physical integrity of refugees. But we have effectively shredded up the Refugee Convention in different ways. There were bombings in London on the 7th of July, 2005. And Tony Blair said, a few days later, the rules of the game have changed. They are rules, and it isn't a game, but they changed. And the same men that he had locked up for three and a half years interned indefinitely without trial, who had succeeded in the House of Lords. Internment was not lawful. The House of Lords used language that was intended to stand against all comers for all time. They said, what we have to fear is not terrorism, but laws like this. This is the stuff of nightmares. That's what the law lord said. But those same men, five months later, after they'd been released, when there were bombings in London, committed, it was known within two days, by British nationals, born and bred in Yorkshire. Nevertheless, this same hapless group of foreign nationals, all refugees, Tony Blair said, we can now deport them to their countries of origin. We're, in, we're entering into diplomatic assurances. We're not worrying about those countries keeping on torturing at all. Torture chambers are still there. We're just going to get an assurance for this man or that man from Jordan or Algeria or Libya. They'll be safe. Gaddafi says so. There's a monitoring group that will ensure they're safe. Who's in charge? Gaddafi's son. 
Each of these countries, appalling regimes, perpetrating the worst of crimes upon their own citizens, had been baying for the blood of those citizens, all of whom were dissidents opposed to those regimes, baying for their blood for years. And here was the opportunity in Libya to get contracts for oil, in Algeria to get contracts for oil, in Jordan to have strategic economic placement in a country where in fact the United States gives it one-fifth of its national budget annually. But Jordan, the country most trusted by America for rendition and to carry out torture, the most trusted ally in the war on terror to breach all international human rights. Our commitment to the Refugee Convention was therefore in one fell swoop violated and our international obligation under the Torture Convention to do everything in our power to eradicate torture worldwide completely betrayed by upholding regimes that torture, by entering into alliances with them, and by suggesting that by a rotten promise, unenforceable, if it were breached, we could make yet another political statement. The rules of the game have changed, and we will deport people to countries that torture.